Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Imanshu Chabla, Regional Communication and Program Manager at Friedrich Norman Foundation, South Asia. And it's my pleasure to extend a warm welcome to our esteemed audience, distinguished panelists, our moderator and friends to our today's web talk, India Votes Inclusive Democracy 2024, which is organized in collaboration with our German office from the state of North Rhine-Westphalia and with one of our long-term and important partner organizations in Delhi, SMART, seeking modern applications for real transformation. As we gear up to 2024 general elections in India starting this week, today's web talk holds immense significance as we explore the critical aspects of India's democratic processes with focus on electoral procedure, participation of women and youth, and consideration towards minorities. Without further ado, I would like to invite Ms. Archana Kapoor, founder and director of SMART, to share her welcome remarks for this webinar. To you, Archana. Uh, thank you so much, Himanshu. And uh, this is actually not a thank you note, but I would like to thank each one of our panelists for joining us uh, and Simi for agreeing to moderate this show. I can't uh, think of a better panel, and especially, you know, when we are going to polls in uh, just two, three days. I think this is a very, very uh, much needed webinar to understand from former Chief Election Commissioner, Mr. Qureshi, from Sanjay Kumarji, who's just come up with the survey from Ankita. Um, it's great. We are very, very happy to be here and partner with FNF. We also have this very long standing, six year long relationship with FNF. Uh, SMART was the first organization to have built a game on Indian elections called The Poll, which was supported by FNF. Uh, the, the, theme and the topic for today's webinar is also very interesting because we know that you know um, uh, when we talk about inclusive democracy this is uh, in it lies at the heart of a thriving and just society and india is the largest democracy where every individual regardless of their background or identity has an equal voice and can express their views through this uh, very important thing uh, of elections and going to vote it affects our lives for five years and for many, many years, actually, in a certain way. And um, I'm really looking forward to hearing from the most eminent people what they think about the upcoming elections. How do you think uh, it will be a very inclusive elections where everyone will have the right to exercise their vote? We've heard several stories earlier where some people have been denied. I hope that this is more transparent, more accountable. And we have a very, we can we can preserve our very very vibrant democracy. So thank you so much, Himanshu. I also want to thank uh, Dr. Klein for uh, this you know long standing partnership and for working with us and for always supporting the work that we do. Thank you so much to FNF, all our colleagues there, and to Dr. Klein in particular. Thank you. Over to you, Himanshu. Thank you very much, Arjuna, for those repeating comments. Now, we will hear from our moderator for today, Simi Pasha, an independent journalist and filmmaker based in New Delhi, known for her insightful reporting on politics, society, and gender with renowned media houses such as CNN, IBN, Network 18, and India Today. She'll guide us through the engaging discussions during the web talk today. Simi, the floor is yours. Thanks, Imanshu. Uh, we're discussing elections in the world's largest democracy, and they're nothing short of a festival, really, here in our country. Elections for the 18th Lok Sabha Lower House of the Indian Parliament will be held in seven phases, starting from 19th April to 1st June. Approximately 916 million people are eligible to cast their vote and uh, will be electing 543 members of parliament. Uh, as we already know, Prime Minister Narendra Modi is seeking a third term as a prime minister. And he's faced an opposition which is uh, seen as fractured and united at the same time. Many say it's a battle between uh, David and Goliath. Uh, and it, the battle obviously has everybody on the edge of our seats. Without further ado, let's get started. I want to introduce our panel. I have uh, Dr. Shahabuddin Yaqub Qureshi, who is the former Chief Election Commissioner of India. He has featured twice in the Indian Express's list of 100 most powerful Indians. Uh, he's authored several books, including one titled An Undocumented Wonder, The Making of Great Indian Elections. This book, in fact, can be read as a textbook for understanding the complexity of Indian elections. Uh, I welcome you, Dr. Qureshi. Uh, our uh, second panelist is Professor. He's a political analyst and sophologist. He served as the director of CSDS, which is the Center for Study of Developing Societies. 
He currently holds the position of co-director of CSDS Lokniti program, which does research work on elections and democratic politics, uh, electoral patterns and voting behavior. Two very interesting issues are the key focus of his research. We're looking forward to a very interesting engagement uh, with you, Professor Kumar. Thank you for joining us. And uh, thirdly, we have uh, Ankita Dhar. She's a young multimedia journalist with Behen Box. She reports on the intersection of gender, labor, sexuality and education. Ankita and her team have been working on a feminist uh, election newsroom, which is creating accessible voter guides to make people more informed. Thanks for being here, Ankita. We were also going to be joined by uh, earlier by Dr. Zoya Hassan, but because of some unforeseeable circumstances, she's uh, not been able to uh, join this afternoon. Uh, I'll start with Dr. S.Y. Qureshi. Uh, Dr. Qureshi, the uh, Indian elections are a mammoth exercise from the announcement of the Code of Conduct to voting in several phases across 28 states and eight union territories, and finally counting and declaration of results. You've been the Chief Election Commissioner and you've handled the entire process from the inside. What, according to you, in brief, are the biggest challenges that the EC is faced with? Well, uh... Surely the sheer magnitude and scale because almost 1 billion voters are involved and we have to make sure that not one, not one, I repeat, is excluded. Our uh, spread is very wide. We have a polling station uh, 1,200 kilometers from India's mainland and only 87 kilometers from Indonesia's Sumatra Island. There also we have to go, uh, give as good an election as in Connaught Place of Delhi. Therefore, uh, Making it accessible to everyone, that is the biggest problem. And of course, by keeping it free, fair, credible, uh, safe, and uh, free of hate speech, that is, will be a, the attempt of the Election Commission. Dr. Rashi, a quick second question uh, from you. You know, the Election Commission's role has cut out. You said it's logistically a mammoth exercise. But you know, over the last few years, questions are being raised about the neutrality of the Election Commission. Why do you think that is? Well, there, there were some issues because the election commission or any institution at one particular point of time is uh, the incumbents at that time. In 2019, the election commission came in for a lot of criticism. But before and after, actually, there was hardly any question raised. So I hope that the present commission is conscious of the, fa the this fact and they will do a good job. They will restore the credibility which uh, was, of course, dented in 2019. Right. Uh, Professor Sanjay Kumar, your team at Lokniti carries out pre-poll surveys and post-poll surveys to determine voting patterns and trends. Can you explain the factors that determine uh, how a certain group of people will vote? For example, the considerations must be different for different groups like minorities, for Dalits, women, migrant workers, the LGBTQI community. Uh, how do you determine which party is taking the lead in which community and what are the issues relevant to them? Uh, see, when we do our large-scale survey, this is a randomized sample which we take. We don't go to specific communities of people. We go to, you know, all kinds of people. So when, when our uh, investigators go to the field, they're not looking for uh, an educated young women to speak to. So they go, they go to the randomized houses. So they will come across various kinds of people, various kinds of voters, which you mentioned about. We don't ask different set of questions to different kinds of voters or different sets of voters, which you mentioned. We have a standard questionnaire and that's all the survey technique all about. Standard questionnaire to be asked to all kinds of people, all kinds of voters. It is only at the time of doing the analysis, we try and segregate it because we also ask the background variables of the voters. If my investigator comes to you, after asking all the opinion related question, he would ask for your age, gender, education, occupation, religion, caste, and various other things. So this is the data, this is how the data is collected for the 10,000, 20,000 sample which we do across the country. And we do the analysis uh, the way you wanted me to present that. And we try and look at whether the concerns of people belonging to different religions are different, whether concerns of people belonging to different castes are different, whether voters belonging to different age groups, the concerns are very, very different. Uh, normally, we don't find concerns of voters sharply different if we look at, you know, different sections of voters, except few, we can take few examples. Uh, but generally, you don't find huge variations in the concerns of the voters, whether they 
are young, old men, women living in rural India or in urban India. The biggest consideration of voting of the Indian voter is the party. 65% of Indian voters vote for the party. They don't even look at the candidate. Many don't even know the name of the candidate. I can bet that a very large number of people in Delhi this time won't even know the name of the candidate. Reason being very simple. Large number of candidates are new candidates. I think except one, uh, which can the BJP has changed all the, the six candidates and only one sitting MP is contesting election. Look at the other parties, the BJ, the Congress and the Amani party. They have also put up new candidates. So a very large number of Indian voters, whether irrespective of religion, caste, gender, education, etc., go for the party. They look for the party. They look for the party symbol and they vote for that. Okay. Okay, Ankita, this one's for you. A recent article published uh, in the Hindu says that the Election Commission has recognized that people from urban areas, young voters and migrants, women and minorities form a big 300 million voters. And these are the people who did not cast their vote in the 2019 elections, a large percentage of them. That's almost 30% of the electorate which didn't cast their vote. Your recent article in Behenbox suggested that getting a voter ID is not a priority for the LGBTQI community. Do you think this is the voter ID is not being a, a priority and voting not being a priority is the reason why a large percentage doesn't vote? Thank you, Simi, for the question. Um, certainly. So uh, in my article also and uh, in the Hindu article as well, what was uh, revealed was that 30% of the electorate did not vote in 2019. So we further investigated it by looking at certain sections of the community, mostly marginalized sections, looking at uh, trans people within the LGBTQIA community, migrant voters, student voters, women, young women voters. And what we found is that accessibility is a problem. More than voter awareness, more than voting being a priority, it is accessibility that is the problem which is deterring these people from voting. For instance, in India, there are 450 million internal migrants. And that is the data that the census of 2011 gave us. In 2024, that data is going to be way more than that. For those migrant workers, there are no plausible means for them to vote. So what happens to that section of the electorate who cannot cast their votes because they're informal workers, they're seasonally employed. Similarly, for transgender people within uh, within the LGBTQIA plus, plus community, the problem is that if they want to vote in their preferred gender, then their voter IDs need to reflect their preferred gender. It needs to reflect their preferred name. For them to do that, they need to have a TG card or an identity card which affirms their gender identity. Now there's a bureaucratic process involved where, you know, it's hard for them to get a TG card in the first place. So if they do not have a TG card, how do they apply for a voter ID with their updated gender? So this section of people who wants to vote gets left out. Similarly, we also looked at student voters, migrant student voters who go who go to different cities and towns uh, to study what happens to them is that they cannot go back to their constituencies to vote now the eci has a form called the form 4.1 or it's called the annexure 4.1 where a university student can vote from their university constituency what they need to do is they just need to get it signed from the university now this form which we investigated we found uh, through another organization is nowhere visible on the ECI website. I had to do a great deal of snooping for me to find that. Students don't even know that this form exists. So uh, Young India Foundation, one of the organizations that has been campaigning for young people's voter registration, they have been going from university to university telling students about this form. And most of the students, uh, they didn't know, know about this form. So this is the way in which large sections of people are excluded. And I can go on and on about it, but I think uh, in the rest of the questions, I can address all the other issues that have come up. Dr. Gureshi, that's an interesting point that uh, Ankita is raising. 30% of the electorate is not able to cast their vote because of logistical reasons. Shouldn't this, uh, isn't this something that the election commission should be looking at? Yes, of course. The election commission is very concerned about voters or not which is why we had set up a voter education division. But th there is a lot of disinformation and misinformation here. One, uh, in my when I was in the election commission, we received a representation from transgender community that they are not able to vote because of a form six, which is for the new voters. It says that your name and your gender, male and female, were the two options given. 
instantly, believe me, it took me, it took us 30 seconds to decide that we create a third gender and we called it other. And we introduced M and F and O and uh, the transgender community celebrated. It was reported in the newspapers. A few years later, it went up to the Supreme Court in another context and Supreme Court uh, also uh, upheld the same thing, not uh, an appeal against our order, but separately. But instead of other, they called it third gender. So it is not T. So to say that they are not able to enroll, I'm surprised because our form very clearly gives all three options. A male, I'm a male, you are a female, and there's somebody, the, uh, the third gender, You all you need to do is write T there. Now, second thing about a student and another migrant, the rule is, the law is that wherever you are normally resident for more than six months, you have to enroll this, uh, yourself there. A student doesn't come for two months, they come for three years, four years, five years. So they have to enroll the, as, a, as a, like you and me as an ordinary voter. And earlier, what used to happen was that we, the, the, you, you have to cancel your registration where you're coming from and register here, which was cumbersome. We made it easy for you. Uh, it says, uh, please apply uh, on Form 6. Just mention your previous address and we ourselves will get it struck off from there, not your liability. So because so that you can uh, vote from here. Now, many people say migrants are have to go back to why Should they go back? They should vote here because they, they are living here. And in fact, the political cloud which the vote gets. Now, if they want facilities, that some people coming, say, UP, Bihar, uh, Odisha, wherever, living in some parts of Delhi, if they don't have a vote, uh, vote in their hand, nobody will care about them. Therefore, voting right is more important where they're living rather than back home. When they go back home, they can be restored there. Such a, it seems there are too many slips between the cup and the lip because provisions have been put into place, but they've basically the voters might not have been able to connect uh, with it. But it's, it's a considerable percentage of the electorate which is unable to cast uh, its vote. Uh, Dr. Qureshi, one more question. You know, we we also talk about transparency in elections, uh, and you know, one cannot ignore the topic of electoral bonds, which is uh, currently in the news. The Supreme Court recently struck that down as unconstitutional. Details of payments for sixteen thousand crores have revealed uh, have come to light with allegations of crony capitalism and quid pro quo uh, arrangements between donors and parties. You know, uh, the Chief Election Commissioner uh, recently addressed a press conference where he said. That transparency is important, but the identity of the donor should also be protected. That like his privacy should be restored. How would how do you see this uh, this problem that the election commission and the democracy is faced with? Yeah, yeah. Uh, although the personally, I feel you know for seventy years the same donors have been donating, and they never complained about uh, the transparency or secrecy. They were donating, and they are smart enough to donate to all political parties. They were donating to rivals. So whosoever comes to power, it didn't matter to them. So suddenly, why they got interested in secrecy, I failed to understand. But it doesn't matter. Granting them that, I have offered a solution. Recently, I wrote an article after the electoral bond judgment in the Supreme Court because the skeletons will keep coming out of the cupboard of many people as the debate will go on. I said, what now? What is the way forward? And the way forward is create a national election fund. Donating to National Election Fund, nobody will be scared. All the donors uh, will donate to, all corporates will donate to National Election Fund from where the money will be distributed to political parties based on their electoral performance. Because they have to be serious people, otherwise all kinds of bogus organizations will mushroom. So based on political performance, their money will be distributed. One formula which I have been mentioning for 20 years, for 15 years, but now our government will have to take it seriously. 100 rupees per vote. Now, if you, uh, that was, or uh, we can make it 150, 200 rupees per vote. So that will add up to about uh, 6,000 crores or 12,000 crores. And that is the money which all political parties, with all the bullying and arm twisting and corruption, they raise, they, as they report to us, that they can raise 6,000 crores by all kinds of dubious means. Here they get it uh, by check with grace. So therefore, uh, this National Election Fund, which is uh, used in 70% of uh, European countries, and if it is working there, why will it not work in India? So that's something which I've been suggesting, but at least for the first time, it is now being uh, discussed. For 10 years, it was not discussed. That's actually a very good idea, and it'll make, obviously, the process more transparent also. Uh, Professor Sanjay Kumar, you know, because of the revelations that have come to light right now, 
I want to understand if you think the the, the electoral bond scam, as it is being known now, will be affecting voting pa voting patterns this election season, or do you think that there are more pressing matters like uh, employment, uh, corruption, poverty that will determine how people cast their votes? Uh, at the moment, it's very difficult to say what will determine their voting choices. But my own sense is that the electoral bond bond issue is not an issue which is finding resonance on the ground. Uh, Prime Minister Modi is campaigning or attacking hard uh, on the opposition on the issue of corruption. Uh, so corruption is an issue, both if you look at the campaign tone. On one side, Prime Minister Modi is trying to attack the opposition alliance, the India alliance, which he refers to as an alliance of the corrupt political parties, corrupt leader. At the same time, the opposition parties and leaders are also uh, trying to pick up the issue that you look at the issue of electoral bond, BJP has been able to receive money by arm twisting some of the company. But uh, if, if I look at this issue, generally people are not very bothered about this issue because normally people think it is acceptable. This is nothing new. Two things make it dilute the issue. One, all political parties have received money through electoral bond. So people think what is, what is uh, new about that, that all political parties have received money. Second, People also believe that this is nothing new. This has been happening for a very long time. Political parties have always received money from business houses. It's only at this moment that we have come to know that which party has given, uh, which company has given money to which party, which was kept hidden by, you know, the rule which was inappropriate, which seemed inappropriate, which has been now struck down by the Supreme Court. So this is the electoral bond as such is not an issue on the ground. Yes, corruption is an issue on the ground, but even on this issue, BJP uh, scores much better compared to the opposition parties because Prime Minister Modi keep referring to uh, the, the opposition leaders as corrupt parties, as opposition parties as, as corrupt. And one big asset with Prime Minister Modi is that he himself remains to be seen as an honest. So whatever he says, it seems to be more convincing to the people compared to what the leaders of other opposition parties say. Uh, yeah, that's the interesting. Other, Professor the other Sandeman, mean, Prime Minister Modi has been talking about it. The Prime Minister Modi has been talking about it and talking about the electoral bonds issue. But and he says because of the electoral bonds, corruption has come to light. But fact is that his government fought in the Supreme Court against revealing the identity of the donors. Yes, it is true. But as I said, you look at the the big narrative first. Who is saying what? It is it it uh, it is about uh, the faith on the person, and then it the whatever is being said by that person is related to that. So if you know that somebody is 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 a, has a habit of speaking, you know, like uh, if you don't trust the person, even if he says the right thing, good thing, people don't trust. If you trust the person, if you have faith in that person, even if he tells. Tell lies, that is what people are ready to accept. So it is true that we know the legal situation, the legal situation about that, that government fought against, uh, the, the, the issue was raised by uh, ADR in the Supreme Court and the government was fighting against that. But these are nitty gritties which people don't understand. People go by the, the overall perception and the overall perception is that the parties in opposition, whether we are talking about Congress or other regional parties, they seem to be more corrupt than the BJP. That's the narrative which goes down well in the minds of the people or more. That is the narrative which is brought by more people on the ground compared to the narrative that BJP is more corrupt compared to other parties. All right. And uh, Ankita, does corruption lead to further marginalization of communities that are already struggling to find a voice in the political system? Uh, so, uh, I feel that more than corruption, uh, the the question should be about it. It's more a it's more of a structural issue. Marginalization is happening anyway. It's built in the system. The our welfare schemes, all our uh, systemic uh, provisions that are in place, are created in a way that always will disprivilege the marginalized. So more than a corruption question, it's a structural issues thing. That's what we have also tried to within our uh, media house. That's also what we have tried to look at constantly. And um, I would also like to respond to Dr. S.Y. Qureshi about uh, 
how you know like transgender people there is the option of you know t or the other gender for them to take that so here this is an instance of how uh, structural issues come in because even if they take on a t what happens is they will have to upload a gender certificate or any certificate that affirms that they are a transgender person you cannot self declare that the provision doesn't exist yet in the eci website i've gone through the website it doesn't exist yet so this is the structural marginalization that i'm talking about more than corruption this is the issue similarly for uh, migrant uh, voters also uh, even if the eci has provisions to shift one's residence from their constituency to the place that they are in but we know that the the statistics the data at place is that there is a 31% digital divide between the people of india 31% of indians do not have access to uh, are not digitally literate so how do they do that uh how do they register how do they shift the, that vote this is not me saying this is the oxfam report saying so these are some structural issues that we should be looking at and it's not like eci's other chief election commissioners have not done work around it for instance in maharashtra the former chief election commissioner shrikant deshpande what he did was he set up voter registration camps for anti dnt women uh to to so that they can register as voters and they can they can use any address as their voter address basically that is one of the problems that emerge right because they keep moving they are a migrant community they can't give a permanent address similarly for transgender people also because you cannot self declare your uh, uh, gender so shrikant deshpande did this for the trans community as well he set up a voter registration camp and he made sure that they can they, uh, a sizable section of people they could self declare their gender and they could be registered voter ids so the thing is that there can be provisions set at place which can address these structural problems especially for migrant voters which which this is not something that i am saying but civil society organizations activists researchers have been saying this for a while that there should be the provision of postal ballots so that they can vote from anywhere that they can currently nris have access to postal ballots so i i just don't understand why a sizable section of people that is the informal workforce in our country does not have that provision but nris have that which is food for thought for us to all think about dr kreshi would you like to respond to that Yes, yes, two, three things. And number one, uh, when I fill up a form, a form for application as a voter, the the options are male, female, or uh, transgender. T, the third gender. When I say male, I don't approve any any certificate uh, to prove that I'm a male. I just write M. So in this case, although they only have to write T, what certificate is they demanded from that? I really don't know, and it doesn't have to be on the website. Just read form six. If form six has a column called T, which is the third gender, that is enough. So male, female are the third. So therefore, uh, and secondly, you know the migrant, thirty uh, percent, all that. Uh, you know we have a concept of BLO, booth level officer. Booth level officer is either your school teacher or uh, some uh, petty official close by whom you are supposed to know. Uh, you should go to go there. And election commission, uh, forget about I being IT savvy. election commission visits your home every home twice a year door to door so uh, therefore you don't have to be it savvy just just to exactly find out whether your name is missing if uh, if it is they give you the form if uh, some correction is required they give you another form form 8 if uh, some somebody has to be deleted because he has moved or uh, died the form 7 so uh, the fact that the this is the only organization which go door to door to 1 billion people so uh, after that to say that uh, you know they have no access and nothing that is wrong finally people like uh, ankita and uh, ngos uh, i uh, fully understand that uh, uh, many people are not uh, tech savvy even i can't find my name don't please publicize it on the on the net but there are some people some young people in every neighborhood who should do this job young people should go to every neighborhood go to 10 homes and see uh, whether names are missing and help them to do that we have been uh, appealing to young people uh, to volunteer and i think that the moment needs to increase a bit well let's just civilian help is always uh, welcome back press one more question you know the model code Voting will take place in seven phases for the parliament. This will be the largest ever election in the history of independent India, second only to the elections that were held in 1951 and 52. Despite digitization and access to the kind of logistical mobilization that we have, 
why is the duration of elections increasing rather than decreasing? Yeah, that's actually a good question. Uh, let me first tell you that the, the reason why we used to have phased election for the last 20, 25 years is only to save lives. Uh, because, you know, there was a time 20 years ago in UP, Bihar, Bengal, where on the poll day there used to be 100 murders. And in the month leading to the poll, about 1,000 murders. So that is the time when we started uh, introducing what is called paramilitary force, which is nothing but central armed police force. Once we started sending them, the polls became peaceful. Now, every political party demands that we bring a paramilitary force because they are from outside. They cannot be pressurized by the local politician. Now, but, uh, but that has been going on and I've been defending it all these years. But lately, in the age of a social media explosion, it is now becoming counterproductive because, you know, our forces move uh, the, in the three or four days but the gundas move in for three to four hours and therefore they, they can create a problem. And at the same time, the social media, the way they spread the fake news, hate news, they can, uh, uh, social media can set the country afire in five minutes uh, by giving a false news. Therefore, in this age, it is better, safer that we finish the election in one day, which is possible, and 30, 32, 33 days, we are out. That will be the best and uh, the government which itself has been demanding simultaneous election because of prolonged election, everything comes to a standstill. Why are they the, encouraging a prolonged election? Why did they not press for a shorter election? Uh, in fact, the, the, these phases, we never had so, so much gap, seven days and even 12 days gap between phases. Our effort was, the phases were essential because the forces were limited. We had to circulate them. But our effort was not to make it more than four or maximum five days. In this case, minimum is seven days and maximum 12 days. What is, what is this happening? I don't know what is the reason. I don't have full fact. They were, full fact must be before the commission. But the, the, you have raised a serious issue which needs an answer. And I do feel that in the social media age, particularly uh, one phase election is the best thing to do because Safety factor. You might say that uh, since we introduced it for safety, there are hundred other measures we have taken for safety. For instance, we the three four months before the election, we start going and review with the uh, police captains how many non bailable warrants are pending. The non bailable warrants means murderers, decoys, kidnappers who are missing, and police say they are not traceable, whereas they are appearing on page three every the uh, second day. So we when then we call the SP. It actually shows the list. 200 people, 300, 500. It's pending for six months, one year. We tell them, if in 15 days you don't find each one of them, look for another job. And all of them are found. And then we ask people to deposit their arm. We have started doing vulnerability mapping of every village. Who are the criminals? His name, his father's name. Who are the people is going to attack? We have all that. And we have, you know, can you imagine, see me, 100,000 video cameras are chasing all the candidates all the time, 24 by 7. So if they had any intention of committing crime, they cannot. So we have taken so many measures for safety of election that uh, the phased election and paramilitary dependence can be done away with. And shorter election will give you a peaceful election and without hate and uh, uh, the, the, all the negativity which is spread by social media. Now, very good suggestions coming to me, Dr. S. Rakhore. I think the current election commission needs to take note of these suggestions and also explain why such a long election is being uh, held this year. Uh, we also, uh, uh, you know, this webinar, we, uh, we've got audiences and we're asking participants to post questions to our panelists. We've got one question for uh, Professor... Uh, can I, can, I, can, I, can yes. I just add a trivia to the entire discussion which is going on about male female transgender and about yes absolutely about about uh, uh, the updating of electoral rolls and how election commission comes door to door every 6 month uh, just this is a trivia that for the last 10 years on the electoral roll i am listed as women f and i have and i have i have I have met this request to for the correction twice or maybe three times. It has not yet been corrected. Even yesterday, a couple of days ago, 
when I received the the list, it is still female, which I again tweeted. So just a trivia to yes, there is a lot of work which election commission does, but I think a, a lot of effort needs to be done about updating the electoral roll, which is so important because that's the basic tool. That's the basic tool of uh, people's participation. And I still believe there is a lot of problem in the electoral roll. Absolutely, Sanjay. Dr. Professor Sanjay Kumar, uh, one of our uh, panelists has a question for you. The question is, yes, uh, you, me. you want to respond? Okay, sir. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not uh, respond. Just an inter uh, interjection. Uh, actually, the uh, what uh, the professor has uh, flagged is a very important issue, and I've been saying that all the pol political parties and opposition parties they are attacking the EVM, EVM, EVM. They want to go back to the ballot paper. They are wasting their time, and I've been saying they should focus more on the electoral role which is a more crucial thing because the election can be won and lost before the election by the, the mistake and the manipulation of the election uh, electoral role. See, that, that is the more important thing. Sanjay Kumar, female. Yeah, because you have not proved the certificate as yes. uh, Ankita was saying. I, yeah. Tomorrow, tomorrow I, have, I will go for a medical checkup to get a certificate that I am a male. Yeah. But are you allowed to vote? When you go there, are you allowed to vote? No, that, is, that has always happened. They have always allowed me to vote. Always. Do Dr. Gresham, there's one question from the audience which has come for you also. That You, you know, a lot of questions uh, and complaints are raised to the Election Commission. But like one of our guests is saying that the Election Commission seems to be biased and uh, nobody responds to them. What's the way out? Well, I wish the, this complaint had not arisen. I'm very disappointed when I hear any complaint against the election commission. Uh, we didn't have it in our time. Uh, we were the most open, most accessible organization. Why uh, they are not so uh, now? Uh, it is for them to uh, uh, introspect. Well, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Kumar, there's one question for you also. Uh, your organization, CSDS Lokniti, conducts a lot of people uh, surveys. Uh, this question is for somebody who wants to know what is the impact of surveys uh, on voting behavior? No, uh, we did try to ask this question a couple of times in the survey and we figured out that uh, in reality, it doesn't make any difference or very little difference on the voting pattern. What we call, uh, you know, the a bandwagon effect and the underdog effect, which is to say if the survey is suggesting party A winning, there are people who go along with that sentiment that, okay, let me vote for the party A because party A is winning. Why should I be voting, wasting my vote? But there are also voters who don't want to vote for the winning party and they would say, oh, party A wins, seems to be winning based on the pre-poll survey. So I should be supporting the party which is, seems to be weaker. So it has both the kind of impact, but on a very limited, tiny section of voters. It, it has an impact on a very tiny section of voter. Yes, people read it with an interest, but I don't think that it is making huge difference on the voting choices of the people. May I? You know, if uh, it makes no difference, why do people spend their money on uh, conducting these bogus surveys? It's not going to make any difference. And to say it doesn't make a significant difference, I don't buy that. The law is Undue, if even one person is an unduly influenced by misinformation, that is uh, the killing the purity of the electoral process. So by, Therefore, that, you know, by that logic, by that logic, we will have to, you know, seal everybody's mouth. All journalists, all analysts, all academicians, everybody. No, 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 no. Just a minute, just a minute, professor. You cannot be so cynical because you know there a few years ago. I saw a news, a news nation uh, was a news channel where for five hours I saw an expose of these were posters, uh, not uh, CSDS, uh, let me make it clear. 11 of them, they were all admitting how they manipulate the data and they would not let go a client. For instance, one client said, I want uh, you to show me winning 200 seats. So he says, all, we have already promised it to another party. So the guy started going away. He said, oh, wait, wait, wait. We'll find a way. What we'll do is we'll form another company. That company will show you winning 200 seats. And then we have two editors in our pocket. 
they will be discussing on the tv channel which surveys were better survey so you know this kind of thing they called it was called operation prime minister the fact that they themselves were explaining how they manipulate so in that uh, situation uh, we research is a good thing i did my phd election commission does surveys but surveys if they are done with honest intention csb is the, the only honest survey because they have no commercial motive but others are totally commercial and uh, you uh, you see the result and if it was scientific two and two we will always make four if it is a scientific study it will not make that another thing depending on how much you want it to be so therefore uh, professor that was a bit cynical from you not acceptable not from you <laughs> But which is why you also have people no, survey. Uh, no, no, I'm, I'm happy that different uh, surveys. No, the results are no, very no, I'm, different. I'm very happy that you have made that distinction. That uh, and and that distinction is really there. That we are not pollsters. And I would fully support what you have mentioned about various agencies which are doing polls. Pollsters, they are pollsters. We try and do our surveys, academic surveys, very very carefully. So. And what you mentioned, I am also aware of that. I think I have also seen what of one of those exposes. Uh, there is also a popular saying. One of them was saying, "Rafu kar sakta hu, payband nahi laga sakta." When somebody is asking, "Ki can you manipulate? Can you manipulate the data?" He's saying, "I can tinker a little, little bit, but I cannot change the entire thing." So I am I am aware of that, and I I also don't have a lot of, or I would say no respect for the kind of polls which are coming these days. Well, uh, on that note, but we're talking about surveys. Uh, Professor Sanjay Kumar, CSDS, Lokpiti recently carried out a pre-poll survey that was published in association with the Hindu newspaper. Can you please quickly take us to some of the key findings of the survey? It was seven pages of report in the Hindu. Yes. How do you expect me to tell you what are the key findings? The big, but the top but from, from audience point of view, the key findings, despite having anxieties about economy, price rise, etc., BJP still seems to be holding firm on the ground. People still seems to be supporting the BJP. Um, uh, but this is the survey which was conducted in the first week of April. Our estimate is 40% vote for the BJP and 21% for the Congress. So there still remains a gap. There are The voters have anxiety about price rise, unemployment. But at the same time, there is a huge endorsement of some of the work done by the BJP government, which is about Hindutva, Ram Mandir, Article 370, and don't forget, a very large number of Indians in the survey believe that the big one of the biggest achieve, biggest achievement of this government is that India has emerged stronger in the world map, on the world map. And all the credit of this goes to Prime Minister Modi. And that is what makes Prime Minister Modi a very popular Prime Minister even at this moment. But, uh, you know, Professor Sanjay Kumar, this is what I cannot, uh, I mean, understand or I struggle to understand at times because your survey says that unemployment, price rise and development are top issues. Neither corruption nor Ramandir have been mentioned by voters as their most important concern. Yet, uh, three, the NDA, which is led by the BJP, emerges with a 12% lead over uh, the rival uh, India uh, opposition. Uh, how is it that despite personal hardships, economic, social, and otherwise, people continue to uh, support the government in power? What, what is the dichotomy? Different considerations. Why is there These a are different considerations? You know, like, yes, I am worried about price rise. I am also feeling the pinch because I am uncertain about my job. But when I look at, uh, you know, if, when I look at uh, the my sense of Hindu pride, and I think, oh, now... I have a sense of pride uh, that I am Hindu and now Hindus have got a Ram Mandir in place. This is a thing which was not possible for any other government for the last 500 years. This is a big achievement. So what, what, which issue do you give importance to? Remember the question which is, uh, the, the, which, is which you are referring to, unemployment price rise. This is what we call an open-ended question. We don't offer menu. We just say, okay, which issue you think is going to be an important issue in this election and on the top of people's mind because they are they are uh, they are encountering in the day to day life price rise and unemployment so price rise has been mentioned by 23% people as the first option and unemployment has been mentioned by 27% people uh, just one minute to give you an example you go to a restaurant and the 
waiter comes and say, ma'am, what do you want to eat? There's no menu in front of you. And you suddenly say, dal makhni. Okay? But dal makhni is served, but at the same time, the waiter comes with a menu and maybe few other dishes. So along with the dal makhni, you also have paneer, you also have kebabs, etc. And now you think, oh, yaar, dal makhni to galat hai, bekar hai. I don't like dal makhni. Kinare rakho isko, thoda kebab ka le. Navratra chal raha hai, but thik hai. We can give an example of kebab. कबाब खा लें या पनीर खा लेते हैं छोड़ दो दाल माखनी मैंने बोल तो दिया था दाल माखनी लेकिन खाने के लिए तो कबाब ही खाना है और नहीं दैट्स व्हाट इज हैपनिंग पीपल आर वरीड अबाउट प्राइस राइज अनएम्प्लॉयमेंट बट एट द सेम टाइम दे आर बीइंग सर्व्ड डिफरेंट थिंग्स ऑन द प्लेट इट्स नॉट ओनली अनएम्प्लॉयमेंट एंड प्राइस राइज ऑन द प्लेट देयर आर फ्यू अदर आइटम्स ऑन द प्लेट एंड देन यू हैव टू फिगर आउट व्हिच वन यू थिंक एट दिस मोमेंट इज मोर इंपॉर्टेंट और लोगों को लगता है पीपल लार्ज नंबर ऑफ पीपल थिंक प्राइस राइज इज हाई टुडे टुमारो इट कैन कम डाउन अनएम्प्लॉयमेंट इज देयर मे बी दिस इज अ प्रॉब्लम पेरेनियल प्रॉब्लम कैन नॉट बी सॉल्व बट लुक द अचीवमेंट ऑफ दिस गवर्नमेंट राम मंदिर इज देयर 370 हैज बीन रिमूव्ड इंडियाज इमेज इन द वर्ल्ड हैज गॉन अप एटसेट्रा एटसेट्रा but uh, ankita you know th th this is something that i want you to uh, respond to as well uh, as somebody who works on the ground as a, as a field journalist people seem to be voting despite their personal circumstances that's the question like they are voting despite the personal but that's an assumption is there more to the question their personal circumstances do not seem to affect their voting pattern the question is first or the way they will, uh, in which they are voting you may be unemployed you may not have uh, uh, you know they may you may not have bread on your table your you may not have access to healthcare your child might not be going to school but because there is an emotive issue at hand people are voting for emotive issues rather than their own circumstances they don't think that a political party or a change in a uh, uh, change in government can sort of improve their circumstances yeah yeah it seems it seems like that so from my interviews and i mostly because i mostly report on gender issues i mostly talk to women across uh, communities there's also a sense of the women that i've been speaking to mostly young women um most of them want to vote it's not like voting is not a priority and uh, most of the people that i've been speaking to have been really passionate about all these issues be it unemployment education and all of the progressive things that we talk about um but even as we are saying that there's a great re, there's a great reliance on you know like one party has been dominating the political landscape for so long and there isn't a strong enough opposition and you know the kind of the way that the media has portrayed uh, the kind of things that the government has done it creates a sense of uh, like you know kaha jaye hum ये भी गलत है ये भी गलत है दिस इज समथिंग विच इज फेमिलियर सो माइट इज वेल आई माइट इज वेल जस्ट गो टू दिस बिकॉज यू नो दे हैव अ स्ट्रक्चर एट प्लेस दे नो वट दे आर डूइंग इट माइट बी रियली बैड फॉर मी बट आई डोंट नो वट टू डू एंड दर्ज ऑल्सो अ सेंस ऑफ विद इन लाइक विमेन वोटर्स इफ आई एम टॉकिंग टू से इनफॉर्मल इनफॉर्मल वर्कर्स और माइग्रेंट वर्कर्स because they're so tied up in their work right because the working conditions are really horrible and they don't have time to engage with these political debates like we do analyzing pre poll post poll all of that so they will look up to me and try to understand who do you think we should vote for because for them uh, things don't really change be it the be it the congress government be it the bjp government working conditions are awful minimum wages are not being paid so it's also the kind of education that people have around these issues which do not really reach people on the ground it's not and and the and the media which does reach on the ground or even like the presence that big media houses have which we have to agree it does have that presence we know what kind of narrative it spreads we know that it will only talk about ayodhya it will only glorify a certain kind of narrative and other issues will take a back seat so because mostly what seems to be the problem is that in the last 10 years there's been so much inflation people's wages have not increased it's it, these are dire conditions but what's very concerning is that people will still say that you know i might i will just probably vote for the ruling government because we don't see any other way about all right uh, ankita i have uh, one quick question for you you know the cscs lokpiti poll that uh, professor sanjay kumar's uh, organization did 
It, the results came a few weeks after the International Labour Organization revealed that more than 80% of India's unemployed workforce comprises of youth. It said that uh, when it comes to job accessibility, the uh, again, CSGS Lokniti survey found that 67% Muslims, 63% Hindus from other backward classes, and 59% scheduled tribes face difficulties in accessing the job market. This roughly is also the same group about in your article in Ben Box, which is missing from the group that goes to vote. This is 30% of the people voters who are not casting their vote. So despite their issues not being addressed, why is it that these people are not casting their votes? I would say this is an accessibility problem. That's the whole idea that we have explored in our in in my in the article that we have published at Behan Box. It's because uh, even there, there are provisions which exist at place, which are very well intentioned, and it uh, it has been done really well. But the thing is, on ground implementation doesn't work. Lots of people don't know how to say, you know, uh, register their vote, shift their residence, who to go to, even if if voting is a priority or not. So that's one of the problems that I've faced, and especially because we've been talking to young people uh, across, young women, especially young women, for our My First Vote project. It's a multimedia data project where we're trying to interview, say, 100 uh, women, gender diverse people from diverse communities, whether they are being able to vote or not. So we have done some 50 interviews so far, and it seems that most of these women, they are very keen and eager to vote, but 20% of that population will not be able to vote. And these are all structural reasons. They they have shifted somewhere else. They don't know how to shift their gender. They 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 know it's on the. I told them it's on the ECI website, but they have not been. Uh, the information has not been promulgated enough that they know about it. Their colleges have not talked about it, or people in their communities haven't talked about it. Or with gender diverse people, it's the same thing. You know, the TG card you have to affirm your gender. It's for male and female you don't have to do it, but for transgender people you have to give a gender certificate. So and then there are other issues which. Uh, concern which which are concerns around mobility women's mobility so if so if they, these are these young women who have gotten married and shifted to another residence they uh, don't have the time to go back to their constituency and vote there can be several reasons domestic household chores etc so there's so many other structural problems which plague this uh, these const these these sections of people and that's what we should be looking at so i wouldn't i wouldn't say that voting is not a priority for this section of people i would say that like i'm saying constantly that it's an accessibility issue and uh, there's also a sense of apathy uh, because of all the news uh, that has been circulating lately about you know the transparency about the evms the transparency about the electoral process which we have also been discussing so a lot of young people have also come up to me and said that i will probably just uh, click on a nota because it really doesn't matter who I'm going to vote for. And like, eventually, this thing is going to be rigged. These are also the narratives that are being like played around. Yeah. All right, we've got a question from uh, one of uh, our audiences. Uh, it's do you, uh, I put that to you first, uh, Dr. Sakreshi. Do you, uh, do you see, do you see foreign attempts to influence Indian elections like uh, other countries have seen, for example, the allegations in the US also, other democracies like Germany? Is that India face uh, these kind of uh, uh, allegations? No, we haven't. But uh, the concern is very serious. And there is an institutional problem there. Um, the Foreign Contributions Regulation Act prohibited any uh, money coming from abroad. If you have to accept 100 rupees from your brother from London and put it in the bank, you will go to jail. But if $1 million come to a political party, nothing happens. So this amendment in law with the retrospective effect of 42 years has uh, in which both Congress and BJP are guilty. Now, this is not acceptable. This is extremely serious because foreign interference in election is a reality. The two superpowers, the fact that uh, Russia could interfere in U.S. elections, to imagine that uh, our uh, hostile countries would not interfere in ours is... Uh, uh, living in a fool's paradise. The fact that we have enabled it. Now, uh, uh, in fact, uh, when I was reading the initial figures on the bond, we even came across, uh, I, I don't know how, uh, whether it was contradicted, that there was some contribution from Pakistan. So how can you allow foreign funding to come in, uh, the, which, which is not allowed to individuals? It is totally unacceptable. Uh, that uh, the reform or the deform should be undone. 
Well, uh, one more question uh, to you, uh, Dr. Kureshi. I also want Professor Sanjay Kumar and Ankita to respond to this. Uh, one of uh, the uh, members of the audience uh, has asked, India has one of the most advanced ID card systems in the world, which is Aadhaar. So why not link voting directly to Aadhaar instead of having a separate uh, ID for voting only? This is for whom? This is from one of the people who's uh, one of the participants of the who, webinar. Who are you asking? Who are you asking? I'm asking Dr. Kureshi, Dr. I'm asking you. Do you think oh, that's a good okay. suggestion? Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. In fact, uh, uh, Ad, uh, our own ID card uh, preceded Aadhaar. In fact, when Aadhaar Authority was being set up, Nandan Neelakarni came to meet me. By then, we have a, a database of 550 million. And that was the time when we had started collecting biometrics in Goa. So we decided that since you're collecting it for the whole country, we will stop collecting it. And once you, you have all the data, we will uh, put the, the two things together. So that is where it stands. After that, there has been a ping pong going on. Uh, the Supreme Court once declared it illegal, then they allowed it. And election commission allowed linking, then uh, disallowed linking. So that uh, there has been lack of clarity, which needs to be settled once for all. I was all for it because uh, for nothing else except uh, finding the duplicate voters. We were uh, using deduplication software across the country, different different districts, and we still there were many in the uh, duplicate voters which was there. Aadhaar would have solved the problem. Now, secondly, there are two things. Uh, use of Aadhaar for identification of voters is essential, is very good. But linking of Aadhaar with any any possibility of identifying the voting pattern, not acceptable at all. Uh, absolutely not. So that uh, we have to uh, take care that Aadhaar is used only for identification of the voter and nothing beyond that. All right, uh, Professor Sanjay Kumar, would you respond to that? That, uh, you know... Uh... Something like this would help uh, getting more people, uh, would help more, enable more people to cast their vote. No, I don't think it has any relationship with the turnout. That if this is done, more people will come to vote. A, uh, a, a pan-India pan card, which is not location-specific. Even today, if you go to cast your vote, it is not that it is not mandatory that you have to carry your epic card. You can go with you know, there are 18 kinds of identity, any kind of identity identity card, you can go and these days, I think, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Pureshi, even these days, the slip which I was showing, because now the slip is being distributed by the election commission, that itself yes. is kind, is to be treated as an identity of the voter. But we can Absolutely. go, uh, you, can, you can go to the polling station with any identity. Yeah, but then let me answer, Simi, your question that uh, you carry your card and you vote or anywhere, that is not possible because that implies that I'm voting, as they're sitting in Delhi, I'm voting for a candidate in Kerala. However, my machine has only the uh, candidates for that constituency. It doesn't have 4,120 constituency data. So the, that will only happen when internet voting is allowed, which is not foreseeable in the near future. Uh, but there was a discussion on this but recently when... Uh, election commission then invited people from pol political parties from uh, various political parties and the idea was to you know on a machine to have a provision of almost 45 to 50 constituencies to be voted on one so there is a discussion a discussion has started taking in this play in this direction but i think it's a long way to go in that direction yes quite right the election commission yeah, you are right they called a discussion but uh, i think they almost abandoned the idea because it yeah. was uh, not feasible because why only 40 constituencies? There are 4,120 constituencies. What if I am outside those 40 constituencies? Therefore, this selective uh, aggregation did not make any sense, which is why perhaps the election commission did not follow it up. Uh, Dr. Vaishya, there's another question that's coming in. I think, and I, I think it's from Germany. It says, shouldn't uh, India move to a system like Germany, which has a mixed member presentation as many electoral researchers have termed the German election system as one of the best available today or like even uh, Sweden, where one uh, that where one that vote percentage equals to the number of seats in parliament. Yes, uh, that is a very good question coming in. I'm so delighted because you know when I wrote my book, which is called an undocumented wonder, the making of the great Indian election in 2014, and uh, uh, before the election was completed, 
and I had analyzed all the systems which were available, including the first part, the post uh, system which we follow, and the proportional representation or mixed system which Germany followed. And I had supported first part, the post system. But after the 2014 election, in my third edition, I had changed my stand because of a specific thing which happened in UP. BSP got 20% vote share, 20% with zero seat. Now, that is not represent, uh, representative democracy. That is when I changed my mind and I said the German model is a good model and they have a mixed model. Half is uh, first part of the poll, the other half is proportional representation because with 20% vote, BSP should have had at least some voice in parliament and having zero voice was totally undemocratic uh, and unfair. And I think we need a national debate on this system. German model, incidentally, uh, although an ideal model, but is a little more complicated because it's a highly educated society. A simpler version of the same model is available in Sri Lanka and even simpler, closer home in uh, yeah. Nepal. I think we should follow the Nepal model now. Right. Uh, Professor Sanjay Kumar, one question has come for you. Uh, it's come for you. It's from Christian. Uh, the question is, are the television channels the main source of information for the masses? Are they independent or mainly influenced by the BJP? Oh, there are two, three questions in this. Uh, are they independent? Yes, technically they are independent. Are they influenced by the BJP? Uh, this is a chart which is being leveled against many television channels that they are being they are influenced by the BJP. Uh, the third part of the question, which was the first part, uh, is television the main source? It is one of the important source of information, but I think still, you know, the door to door or, or the gossip, the, your close circle, whether it is friend, family, neighborhood, etc. That's an important source of information about politics and about other issues. So television remains one of the important source, but not the most important source of information. All right. Uh, Dr. Qureshi, there's one question from uh, for, you, for you that's come. It says, uh, how can hate using religion uh, in speeches by politicians be checked? Well, that is a very, very serious issue. And uh, of course, we have a model code and we have all the laws of the land. Indian Penal Code, Representation of People Act, which uh, prohibit all this. It's a question of enforcement and vigilance. So how the strict election commission is, it is uh, for them to demonstrate and we are all watching. All right. And Professor Sanjay Kumar, this one's for you with regard to uh, I mean, voting patterns in South India and North India. Do you think that uh, people vote differently or do you think similar voting patterns? No, first we should recognize that people vote differently when they have to elect a state government and if they have to elect the central government. And there are enough examples of that, that how people have voted differently. Uh, say, if you look at the 2018 assembly election in Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, Chhattisgarh, and immediately after that, within six months of time, when in 2019, Lok Sabha elections, how the people in these three states voted very, very differently. And there are many examples of that kind, Delhi, etc., etc. South India and North India, I think it's about the choices. Uh, in, North, in, in the North India, it is more a contest between the BJP and it's more bipolar contest between BJP and Congress. Uh, and in the southern state, you have a very strong regional party also because southern states have a distinct different language. People speak a different language. People have very distinct it, it, distinct culture, tradition, food, uh, language. So there are uh, parties which are more caste-based. A very large number of parties you will find, say, in Tamil Nadu or in Kerala, etc. So in that respect, people vote differently. If you look at the electoral verdict, Andhra, Two regional parties, Telangana, one strong regional party, Andhra, all strong regional party. Uh, in Kerala, there are large number of regional parties. Yes, Congress is present there, left is present there. So that is why the choices are different. And we can see the aggregate, the output is that it looks like people in South vote differently compared to people in the North. Professor uh, Kumar, there's another one for you. It says, what is the effect of election rallies and roadshows during elections? Does it affect uh, voting pattern? And also, there are allegations of uh, of people who are coming to rallies being paid a lot of times by political parties. Does that uh, affect their voting? Not all who come to for the rallies are paid. But yes, 
large number of people have paid or at least they have been they are facilitated to come for these rallies facilitation means you know transportation has been arranged bottle of water food to eat etc etc so some investment parties make in order to bring crowd to the to the uh, rally ground whether it is cash kind etc etc uh, the padyatras and the big rallies the road shows i think these are important to let voters know that the party or the candidate in a serious contest i don't think that it is it makes such an impact that it sways the voters in favor or against a political party but you may say that by if this that's the logic then why political parties are indulging into road shows and big rallies it is to create an atmosphere you have to let your the voters know that you are in serious contest we have not given up that is the importance perception and i said perception is the most important thing in indian election at this moment even if you are corrupt or but if the perception is get created you are an honest man hard working you can mobilize votes all right uh, we are almost nearing the end of our webinar ankita i take one last question from you what according to your research and according to the field work that you do are key issues of marginalized communities that are never taken up and are unlikely to be considered because they aren't a political priority thanks me uh, i think i've spoken about uh, a key a few of these marginalized communities like gender diverse people and uh, say students migrated students i'll look at some other sections of the people uh, sections of the community one is persons with disabilities now the eci has made a lot of provisions for persons with disabilities in terms of its saksham app and you know making it accessible creating ramps etc it has a whole like accessibility checklist but when i've spoken to people on ground and i've spoken to experts they've told me that most of these accessible checklists they are not functional on ground for for instance if 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 someone requests for a ramp a, a pwd voter uh in many cases uh, the ramps will be created in a way which are not completely functional there will be gaps between the ramps or it will be too steep so now how does a pwd voter use that ramp so the uh, it's it's mostly about on ground implementation so while it is a sizable section of people or it is it is something that the eci something that the government or the our country looks at as a uh, as a possible it's a vo voter base but what happens on ground is very different especially in terms of disability there's a kind of idea around a certain kind of disability so we we'll look at physical disability we'll look at we won't look as much into di intellectual disabilities we won't look so much into psychosocial disability so there was this one person this ngo person who was who i was talking to who Uh, is based in chennai and uh, they they work with people who have mental health issues and other psychosocial disabilities who he wanted to register as voter so he went to the official required officials in that town to get their voter ids registered now the problem is that they are also homeless people so they don't have a permanent address so how do you use how, what what address do you use for their voter id so there are ways to do that the eci has provisions you know for homeless people you can use some certain like des de destinations now the, the the problem here what happened is that these two people they went uh, to this official and uh, then the official said that but these are people with intellectual disabilities or psychosocial disabilities how can they vote they don't have the function or the capabilities to do that so the thing is that ground level officials are not sensitized there's the stigma around people with disabilities and then the an ngo person he said that you know even if like they have mental health challenges but they are functional people uh, they have yeah. they, they have that way able to cast their votes and then the official said that then why do you want to mark them as pwd voters then that is a forgery they shouldn't be counted as persons with disability so this is what the scenario around uh, the disability section is especially with psychosocial disabilities then if we talk about migrant voters which i have spoken about uh, at length is that I, i don't understand there's 450 million internal migrants in the country why are there no provisions for them like the postal ballot system which has been time and again uh, spoken by people to exercise why is that not something that is done uh, mm -hmm. apart from that there i also i've spoken to also experts who and ngo persons and researchers who have been working with ntdnt women in maharashtra and they have their particular problems which is that first they are a migrant community so they don't have a specific address uh, groups and second is a lot of patriarchy also plays into accessing their voter ids which is that right. if uh, 
sometimes families they will not put their names their daughter's name in the voter rolls because they the the daughters will eventually get married so their names will change so why will you put their uh, names in the voter rolls and then what happens right. is when they get married to their in-laws uh, the in-laws will not put the wife's name in the voter rolls because until and unless the wife has conceived a son because if the wife has not conceived a son then he will divorce her and then like get someone else so this is something which happens at length in many many communities this happens and these are these are just the ground realities and how do we imagine our processes to address these bits because they are also political citizens they also need to be enfranchised uh, so that's mostly what right. i thought thank you so much thank, thank you akira thank you professor kumar thank you dr s y qureshi for joining uh, this uh, webinar uh, i would also now like to uh, hand over to dr carsten klein he is the regional director of the friedrich norman foundation south asia His professional career has always had an international dimension. Before his stint in India, he was uh, managing the department responsible for the international business of the Federal Employment Agency in Germany. He's been living in India for the last three years with his family. Over to you, Dr. Klein. Would love to hear about your Indian experience and observations about our democracy. Yeah. So thank you very much. First of all, to uh, all of you for this extremely insightful and inspiring discussion. Thanks, uh, Pasha. Uh, Mrs. Pasha, for uh, the excellent moderation. Of course, thanks to you, Honorable uh, Dr. Graishi, for uh, joining us, for giving us the chance to discuss with us. Professor Puma, uh, great that you were there, and of course, also thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Dar, uh, for bringing in also some uh, different other um, um, perspectives. Let me just generally say that um, I really feel extremely honored as a convinced uh, Democrat to be part and to be guest uh, in the country during this uh, extremely uh, interesting process of elections in India. And I think that that interest is reflected by many people around the world because India, and I'm very very much convinced about that is really a positive role model for uh, many also democratic states and other states who are still in the process of learning um, about democracies and the processes behind it and i find it extremely relevant that political foundations like the friedrich naumann foundation as of course also the other parliamentarian foundations from germany that they take the opportunity and really reflect on this enormous democratic process especially in times when democracy all around the world comes under enormous pressure So again thank you very much uh, let me um, and allow me to also emphasize my uh, particular thank again to our esteemed panelists we as frisch naumann foundation will definitely continue with articles and with get togethers and uh, i hope that you might also join us after the elections and uh, then we might have a bit of a wrap up or a uh, assessment after the elections together that would be extremely thrilling but allow me also to thank uh, the colleagues in the north rhine westphalia office uh, of friedrich naumann foundation you know that there is this very large interest and it is reflected by our colleagues in germany thank you mr budrich and thank you very much mr fischer not forgetting my own team uh especially mr chavla mrs manvery mishra and all the colleagues and last but not least uh special thanks uh, dear mrs kapoor to your family and uh, to your extremely eager colleagues from smart it is always as you said in the beginning really a huge opportunity to work together with one of the most important uh players of uh, political education uh in the country uh you said that you, you did enormous efforts on um uh, making uh democracy and other um construction structures uh in india more visible by gamification uh you have a lot of range of other activities thank you very much 
again, best wishes to our panelists. Uh, thank you very much for the esteemed audience. Please stay in touch. We are very, very happy if you could uh, give us a command. Uh, we are uh, from now onwards also open with this event on social media. Thank you very much. Let us stay tuned and let us all have a very safe and good 